and welcome to today's uh, talk, which um, I've been looking forward to for quite a long time. We've got two guests, as, as Sumi has said. Our first guest is Neil Hulkarver, who is an applied mathematician and lives in Oregon, and he's got a PhD from Northwestern University. And he's written extensively on the application of voting theory to wine competitions. And that is always a very contentious issue. So thank you very much, Neil. His wine writing can be found in a wide range of academic, popular and trade publications. And he was also a field coordinator for the Slow Wine 2020 through to 2022 guides. And if you're lucky enough and walking around the streets of Oregon, you might well find Neil pouring you a glass of wine um, in a tasting room at the top of Dundee Hills. Welcome, Neil. And then, of course, Charles, who is now merely a name on our um, screens, is one of the best known and, of course, most spontaneous and amusing wine critics in Britain. He presented drinks and occasionally food items for 12 years as one of the Richard and Judy team on ITV program this morning, and has also presented many food and wine programs on Granada Breeze, Taste TV, and UK Food. With his wife, Catherine, he has yeah. written award-winning books about Spain, Portugal, and matching wine with food. He was also one of the two founders and the co-chairman of the International Wine Challenge held annually in London and is recognized as one of the UK's most leading wine judges. He's an honorary president of the Association of Wine Educators, um, a member of a name that I cannot pronounce, but it is something to do with wine in Spain. And then the same, you'll have to say those words, Charles. Um, and the same in Portugal, and he and Catherine have recently left the UK to go and live in Portugal. So welcome to both of you, and we're going to kick off with you, Neil. If I can just ask you all to um, mute, um, and where possible, probably put your videos off as well to get a better connection for, for everybody else. Sorry, just before we begin, Charles, are you able to uh, see and I hear? Now, I can hear you at the moment, which is great. Okay. I've turned off. I've turned off my Wi-Fi. Catherine's turned off our, our Wi-Fi, just in case it's a question of having too many devices trying oh. to access okay. the internet. Sorry, Sorry. So. Ernie, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to look at two problems with wine uh, competitions. Here are some issues that I listed, but I'm only going to focus on the first two, the reliability of judges, and then more extensively on scoring and aggregation methods. These charts are available to anybody on request, by the way, so uh, don't hesitate. They're very dense, but I'm going to do one somewhat lightly, and if you'd like a copy for yourself, just let me know. The first part uh, is on reliability of judges and is based a lot on the work of uh, Bob Hodgson. Um, he did a very important paper in 2008 where he looked at the judges performance at the California State Fair commercial wine competition between 2005 and 2008. They put triplicate samples poured from the same bottle interspersed within a flight. Uh, the judges were asked to categorize the wines uh, according to these eight categories, and these categories were converted to scores. One of the most uh, revealing things is that only 10% of the judges were actually able to replicate their scores within a single metal group, and another 10% scored the same wine anywhere from bronze to gold. Um, these other, these other comments are sort of irrelevant. Um, while this data is from a single competition, there is in the author's mind no reason to suspect the results are not general. So then he went on to do some work with uh, Jean Cal from Southern Methodist University. And they came up with a, what they call a tolerance index. And the next chart um, will tell you about that. This indicates the maximum number of adjacent award categories that are accepted for duplicate wines. So for example, T4 allows a span of at most four adjacent grades, such as bronze to silver or silver to gold. 
they selected that as their expert criterion. If a judge scores the replicated wines within similar scores at a tolerance level, tolerance index of T4 for four flights, they were deemed to be expert. So they looked at 122 judges at that competition over the period from 2010 to 2012, and only 18% performed as experts at a 5% significant level or less. So this is, I'm gonna see if this works. This is him explaining this chart. Oops, maybe not. Ah. Neil, is there supposed to be audio playing now? I, we can't hear that, I don't think. I'm sorry, can you, can you say that again? Uh, is there supposed to be audio playing now? Because I don't hear any audio. Yes, you're not getting audio? Um, Anyone else it. getting audio? No. Okay, I'll just talk you through. This is, this is um, the different tolerance levels that they defined for, uh, that they used to determine an expert judge. And the lines, the length of the lines indicate um, basically in, in, the, in T1, all of the three identical wines have to be rated in the same category. So no award, bronze. Whatever, but it's, it's, it, it's done now. Yeah. So um, the scales have fallen from my eyes when it comes to Mr. Wee. Mm. Because Vivian, you've got your sound. If Vivian, you're not muted. Thank you. Can I proceed? Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Okay. So you uh, so you can see here the lines just indicate where the uh, the three different uh, identical pourings have to land. T two means they can be either in, in any of these two categories. Uh, the one that is selected is a very generous T four, which means that the three identical wines can be binned in any of these areas or this or that. Um, T5, similar and so on. T8 means they basically are just guessing. So uh, Hodgson reported again in 2017 on how the experimental program went from 2009 to 2012 and basically decided that things weren't getting any better. Uh, his conclusions are perfect judges do not exist. Um, they're biased by the discussions that happen afterwards. Uh, male and female judges are equally good or bad. And that after these discussions, judges tended to increase their scores. So the point of this is to show that um, the reliability of judges is indeed suspect uh, under a basic simple test of having them identify the same wine poured from the same bottle in the same flight uh, with some reliability. That's all I want to say about that. And I'm going to go on to some work that I've done. And this is on scoring and aggregate methods. So um, this work relies heavily on Don Sari, who was my dissertation advisor at Northwestern, although at the time I wasn't doing anything relating to voting theory, nor was he. Uh, my PhD in applied math is actually in celestial mechanics, but I became fascinated with this work. Uh, we've stayed in touch over the years. And um, I was sort of dabbling in, in this and went to see the movie Bottle Shock in 2009 which uh, raised in my mind the question of how they came up with the final rankings. And when I learned how they did it, um, it gave me impetus to go and apply these methods that I'm gonna show you to reevaluate the results. So as Don says in his book, and he's written extensively on this, the winner of an election 
may more accurately reflect the choice of a decision procedure rather than the views or preferences of voters. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, the voters are judges and the candidates are wines. So let's take a look at the judgment of Paris tasting, uh, the one I referred to, the subject of bottle shock. Um, you probably know this all very well. There were six California Chardonnays and four French wines uh, tasted against each other, and then six California cabs and four Bordeaux. There were nine judges, um, and in each category, a California wine was declared a winner. So Chateau Montalena Chardonnay 73 and Stag's Leap uh, Wine Cellars Cabernet Sauvignon 73. George Tabor wrote the definitive book on this uh, Judgment of Paris tasting and I was in close contact with him as I did the original work. Here are the wines, you'll see these again. And uh, red wines, here are the judges. Now there's a bit of a sticky point here. Uh, there were nine French judges, but Steve Spurrier and Patricia Gallagher, who were the organizers of this, also rated the wines, also scored the wines. And the question is, whose scores actually went into the final determination? There's some debate about that. Um, George Tabor assures me that only the French wines went into the French judges, French judges went into the final scoring. Um, and the work that I did, and you'll see later, I broke them out separately so you can see the impact of just the French judges and the French judges with uh, Gallagher and Spurrier. So scoring was done, uh, each judge assigned up to 20 points and the wine awarded uh, to, uh, the, high, the highest total uh, points was declared the winner, but all the wines were ranked according to the total wines. Here And therein is the problem. As Ashenfelter and Quant uh, acknowledge, the problem is that this gives greater weight to judges who put a great deal of scatter into their numerical scores and thus express strong preferences by numerical difference. As I like to put it, Easy graders contributed disproportionately to totals violating one judge or one man, one vote. So this is an awful chart. I fully recognize that, but I wanted to show you the complete uh, data that I dealt with. And um, I'm gonna instead now focus on these. So the distortion analysis for the Chardonnay, um, for example, the Chateau Montalena points range from three to 18.5 or 6.17%. The David Brew Chardonnay, the points range from zero to eight if we just looked at the French judges and zero to 11 if we include Gallagher and Spurrier, which is a ratio of infinity. You can't you know, divide by zero and you get infinity. The most generous judge was Pierre Tari, who awarded a total of 126 points. The stingiest judge was Michel Dovaz, um, who only awarded 73. So uh, Pierre Tari had 1.73 times the influence on the outcome that Michel Dovaz had. Similarly, for the red wines, the uh, Ridge Montebello, the scores given range from two to 15 or 7.5 um, for just the French judges. And it went up to two to 17 or 8.5 uh, times with Gallagher and Spurrier. Aubryon points range from 10 to 17 or 1.7 with just the French judges, eight to 17 or 2.13 times if we include Gallagher and Spurrier. Once again, Pierre Tari was the most generous with 135 points um, versus the 92 that Odette Kahn uh, was giving in total. And if we include Gallagher and Spurrier, um, Patricia Gallagher was the most generous or 1.51 uh, over Kahn. Now, 
this is the point dispersions that each of the judges gave and their totals. Um, rather than focus this, I wanna go to the next chart and look at the delta, the differences. What I did for each of the judges and each of the uh, flights was to rank order their scores. You can see at the top here, uh, the highest that Pierre Brejeau gave was 16, the lowest was zero. And I looked at the difference here um, going from one to the other. And you can notice that they're all over the place. You go from uh, one, to, and then you have a two, two, one, zero, uh, two, two, one. You can look here, there's four, two, and so on. Um, this is actually uh, in the weeds showing the reason that you get this, this um, weird dispersion is that the, the uh, score is given by each of the judges is not uniformly assigned. Uh, there is uh, an intensity here given by the amount of points separating the various wines. So I did this for the, uh, for the Chardonnay and I did it for the red wines. And you can see that there's dispersions you know, in some cases, it's very, very tight, almost no, with only a few exceptions here uh, and here. And in some, um, there is a broader dispersion in the deltas. So this is a problem um, of giving some judges disproportionate influence on the outcome for each of the wines. What is needed is a method that normalizes this spacing. And one such method is called the board account. And this was uh, rediscovered by a mathematician, Charles, uh, Jean Charles de Borda, around 1780, when he was looking for a better way of coming up with members of the French Academy. It was first documented by a cleric named Nicholas of Cusa or Cusanus in the 15th century who suggested this method uh, for use in selecting clerics, uh, cardinals. It's a positional voting scheme. That means that each voter rank orders the candidates with ties permitted. They, for the end candidates, the highest level, the highest rank candidate is assigned N minus one point. So if you have 10 candidates, the highest one gets nine, and this proceeds down in uniform fashion, and that's the key to the candidate who is ranked last who gets zero points. When you have a tie, you average the total of the points for the position they occupy. You add up all of these points for each of the candidates, in this case, the wines, and the board of winner is the candidate with the largest point total. The spacing here is what's key. That's what was missing in what I showed you before. So why is, so we have all of these methods of coming up with, with um, ranks, uh, societal rankings. How do you go about selecting from these? So there are some rational criteria, very simple ones, except for one that you can use. You can require that the procedure produces what's called a transitive outcome if the judges give transitive rank. Transitive is very, very simple. If you prefer wine A to wine B and B to C, then that assumes that you prefer A to C. There's a fancy, fancy name Pareto condition. If all of the judges prefer wine A to wine B, then the outcome should have A preferred to B. There's something called unrestricted domain, and this doesn't prohibit, this allows each of the judges to select any transitive ranking of alternatives. And then there's a more complicated one called independence of irrelevant alternatives that requires the outcome, the societal outcome to depend only on the relative ranking of any particular pair. So these are three very simple, very clean, rational criteria. The trouble is that Kenneth Arrow, it's an impossibility, said that the only procedure that satisfies all four of these 
is one where the outcome always agrees with the dictators or equivalently one uh, particular voter's preference. In other words, there's a specific voter so that the societal outcome always agrees with that preference. Don Sori recognized this was a problem and also discovered that if you was, uh, insist on IIA, it negates, it disregards the transitivity. So he fixed IIA and he said basically the overall ranking of any two determined uh, alternatives, lines, uh, determined by each voter's relative ranking and the intensity of that ranking. So he took into account the intensity of the ranking measured by the distance, the number of wines in between. When you do that, he proved that Borda is the only non-dictatorial positional method that satisfies the three criteria plus um, the intensity form of independence of irrelevant alternatives. This is why Borda is better, uh, uniquely so. So now we go ahead and look at the rankings using Borda. And like Ashenfelter and Quant in 1999, we convert, convert the points to rankings. And uh, we have 10 wines. So in doing so, uh, the rankings uh, are assigned nine points to the top, zero to the bottom. We allow ties. And once again, the Borda winner has the highest total score. So this is what it looks like for the wines with the French judges and with Gallagher and Spurrier. So you can see here, and I'll show which wines are which in the next one. So we did this for the Chardonnay and we did this for the red wines and this is the outcome. So there was a somewhat of a change based on the sum of the points. Um, there was an interesting discrepancy that I don't want to go into between the point totals and the sum of the individual points. And the original scorecards were lost, so this couldn't be resolved. So I worked the answer both ways. There was a little bit of a change at the top, but the only place for the Chardonnays where there was a change was for eight and nine. These two wines switched places, basically. The change in the red wines was more profound. In the border ranking, the Obreon 1970 came in first place, whereas it was third if you sum the points and Stag's Leap dropped to second. The uh, rest of the changes here are highlighted in red and you can see there were many, many of them. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in intensity of uh, preference, you can go back, as I said, I'll give these charts to you and look at the, um, the border scores for each, the differences do represent an intensity of preference. Neil, Neil we're slightly running out of time. Um, uh, I'm just yeah. about done. So here are the two wines that came in first place by Borda. Um, I did manage to taste the uh, Aubryon and it was wonderful. And the uh, effort was done again in th 30 years later using Borda and the results were dramatically different. And the references are here. I am done. Thank you. Over to you, Charles. Over to you, Charles. Charles, are you there? Right. Okay. Can you hear me, guys? Is my signal good enough? Yep. Yeah. Good. Um, it was great to I had the advantage of having been able to read through Neil's presentation before, before today, so that was tremendous. Um, now, just I, I would like to talk really about my experience judging at different competitions, because as well as um, the International Wine Challenge, which was started by Robert Joseph and myself, um, it's it, it's been um, I've judged in oh gosh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Turkey. Australia, New Zealand, Chile, South Africa, China, and there are probably one or two I've missed out, but that's what occurred to me when I was thinking my way through this morning. I've done almost all the, the editions of the International Wine Challenge. Um, I missed one because I had hepatitis and I was off the booze. 
and it seemed a bad idea even to taste and spit it out. Um, but anyway, so I've, I've tasted a lot. We started at the IWC, if I can refer to it as that, for, um, for brevity. And I should just make the point that I'm no longer involved with the IWC. I was retired um, last year, um, but I have very fond memories of it, and I still think it's a, it's a wonderful competition. We started marking wines out of 20, and we gave um, bronze medals to those that got 15.5, silver to 17 pointers, and you had to get 18 and a half to get a gold. Ideally, we were working with panels of five tasters. Um, and at the beginning, because we found there were so many wines and we weren't really very organized, Robert and I, um, we gave buys to, the, to a, a new vintage of a wine that had done, um, that had got a silver or gold the year before. This was something we dropped because we realized this was stupid. Um, just the, for those of you who don't know what a buy is, this is a, a free pass into the next round because we always have had at the Wine Challenge um, two rounds. There's a sort of illumin illumination, elimination round where we taste the, the entire entry. And we ask our tasters at this stage to eliminate wines that they think are not worthy of getting anything at all, um, or to say this wine could be, get a commended, which is a category of recommendation we in, introduced, oh gosh, about 12 years ago, I suppose. The, 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 the competition, I should say, has been going for 35-ish years, I think. Um, and um, and the third category was worthy of a medal. Now those wines, those wines deemed by the panels in the first round worthy of a medal were retasted in the second round. So we were giving every single wine that was emptied two chances to perform. And I say that because even in the first round, the co-chairs, the, the top tasters, um, it started off with Robert, myself, Derek Smedley, Oz Clark, and then um, we added Tim Atkin and Peter McCombie um, when um, Reed, um, Reed the, the, the Reeds bought the competition. Sam Harrop came in. He was um, a, a wonderful Kiwi MW who um, was very good on wine faults. He was a he's a qualified winemaker and now sp spends most of his time making wine um, all over. Um, but he was our fault specialist, and he was replaced by Jamie Good when Sam decided he wanted to go to New Zealand. I make mine down there. And, um, challenge. Sarah Abbott passed away. Helen McGinn was born. And now Sam Caporn has replaced me. So they've always been tasters who've worked their way up with the exception of Robert and I, who started it, um, who worked their way up and been seen to be really well-performing tasters, consistent tasters. Um, and the part played by the co-chairs in our competition is enormous because in the first round, the job of the co-chairs is as a backstop. And they are the people who retaste only the wines that have been kicked out. So to give them another chance, if by any chance, say a wine was perhaps a little bit closed when it was tasted by the first panel and it opens up by the time it gets to the co-chairs and they decide, hey, you know, that might get a bronze medal or even, wow, that's gonna be a gold. Um, it gets its moment in the sun in the second round and it's the co-chairs who give it that second chance. I know of no other competition throughout the world that does that um, and indeed, the idea of having a, a two-fold um, opportunity for wines to perform is very rare. Um, the other main difference between um, our, the way that we do it and uh, many other competitions is there is a, a, a system of wine marking um, which was instituted by the Organisation Internationale du Vin, OIV, which marks wines out of 100, as we eventually came to do, but it breaks that hundred down into very complex individual aspects of the wine. You know, you look at the wine and it gets marked for clarity, for brilliance. Uh, I can't remember what other 
uh, intensity, I think intensity of color. And it, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, I'm not sure what the difference between clarity and brilliance is. Um, it's marked for color, I think, as well. And if you don't know what the wine is, how do you know what color it should be? So there are various aspects of that system that I think are uh, very difficult to implement. And what I find myself doing after I had um, marked according to the system a few times was actually deciding what I wanted my final mark to be and making the various categories add up to the number that I wanted to give the wine, which was not at all, I'm sure, what the, the people who devised that marking system intended. What we did, we moved much more towards the system that we have found in particular in Australia and in New Zealand, where you have these um, panels of five people. There are four judges and an associate. The associate is listened to, but not necessarily his or her mark taken into account. And the average mark is then determined by the chairman of the panel. And I can remember once um, I was in Australia judging in a competition there, and I had given a mark which was slightly out of step with the rest of the members of the panel. And so they, and the, the chairman turned around to me in, in, a, in a rather caustic way, said, well, I guess we have to take an uh, um, account of our international judge's mark after all we've paid to bring him here. Um, anyway, um, it, I, I found, and this always evolves, um, if there is any kind of disagreement over the mark, uh, if there's anyone which is really out, who's really out of line, who really feels a wine has been undermarked, there is an opportunity to retaste the wine and there is the opportunity to, to discuss. Now, Neil said how this re-examination and this discussion, in his experience, usually means that the wine is upgraded, the mark that was given before. I haven't found that always to be the case. And sometimes if there was someone who just thought the wine was good and it's rediscussed, um, it ends up where it was before. And likewise, at the International Wine Challenge, when all the co-chairs, the, the, the co-chairs retaste all the wines. And the idea behind this um, was that there are certain panels who are meaner and certain more generous than others. And since you want ideally most, all the results of your competition to reflect the same level of quality, um, we instituted tasting, retasting all the wines because we didn't do that to start with Robert and I. We, we retasted the top marked wines because we felt those we, we had we had to hang our hats on those results. And so we retasted, retasted those. Now, all wines that make it into the second round are retasted by at least one co-chair. Now, if that co-chair disagrees with the result that the panel gave the wine, and when he or she sees the, the, the scores on the bit of paper, he or she can see whether the co-chair disagreed with the rest of his panel, but they came nonetheless to a conclusion with, it, with which the panel chair, sorry, disagreed. He or she can then think, mm, oh, well, you know, I respect that taster. I don't know the other guys. Maybe it's worth going with his idea. Um, but the, the overriding and really important um, rule we have is that if one co-chair decides that he or she wants to change the mark given by the panel, he makes a little mark on the, on the score sheet indicating an arrow up or down, indicating the way in which he wants to move the mark. And he then leaves the, the, the sheet on a table and another, another co-chair comes along. And it is up to that co-chair, the second to, to remark the flight, so to speak, to see whether he or she disagrees with his or her colleague or agrees with the original panel. And it very often happens that if one co-chair wants to change the mark, he's overruled by the, the next co-chair who comes along and says, well, actually, I agree with the panel. So I think it's a, it's a system that has worked very well for us for quite a while now. And what I would say is that we always have said, and I mean, in my absence, I'm sure this is still said, if there's anyone who have useful suggestions to make as to how we can improve the marking system of the International Wine Challenge, please share this idea with us. Because over the years, we have really adopted thoughts that some of our tasters have come to us with. Um, and I think to have an open mind is, is terribly important. 
because we have improved the competition over the years by listening to our judges and tasters and incorporating some of their suggestions. Suggestions, not all suggestions work, of course, but some of them have really been valuable. Uh, other things that we found, we used, what, what we do, it's not every, every, every wine is blind, of course, but we tell our tasters where the wine comes from, what are the grape varieties, um, we tell them the sugar and we tell them the alcohol, so, and, and we tell them the vintage, so that a taster has an idea of what the wine should taste like, knowing these criteria. The only thing we do not say is what the name of the wine is and who made it. So that you can actually give an idea of a, a, a sensible mark to a wine according to what you think is the typical, the best typical form that wine should have. And for that reason, and, and also the fact that we found over the years that it's, it's, it's a good idea to mix and match red wines with white and rosy and sparkling. Um, the International Wine Challenge has perhaps two thirds of the wines that are submitted are red wines, or that used to be the case the last time I saw the figures. Uh, so we try to break up. It's not always, always going to be a whole morning of red wines, it, not a whole day of red wines. Um, you'll get perhaps a flight of fizz to start in the morning to wake you up, then maybe a red and then maybe a white and then a couple of reds or a rosé to try and because we have found that taster Palette fatigue, which I saw was one of Neil's criteria for um, to question in wine marking. Palette fatigue is more likely to set in if you have a whole unremitting half day of one particular type of wine or one color of wine. And for that reason, we also have always mixed up the types of wines that we give one panel of tasters. And I have always found that if you give one panel of tasters only one type of wine through the day, they are more likely to get just fatigued. Um, the, other, the, the other consideration is if you have a panel of tasters selected because of their knowledge of one particular wine style, they tend to give positive marks because they think of themselves as maybe being experts on this wine style, they love these wines, they want to mark them well, and I think you're better off for a wine competition with really good generalists, people who can taste wines from all over the world. One of the things that the Wine Challenge instituted um, about three or four years ago was the idea of having one or two of the co-chairs available during the tasting day, the time when the panel was tasting, during the tasting day for a panel chair to come to and say, look, we've got this flight of wines, we know what they are, we're not really familiar with this style, um, there's tremendous disagreement going on, whatever. But when they weren't really being able to come to a useful conclusion, go to that co-chair and say, can you help us? Now, I was doing that in my last year at the challenge, Oz continues to do that, Oz Clark, um, and I think it's a really useful thing because it enables panels who are perhaps not familiar with the style or who cannot come to a good agreement to, to seek advice elsewhere. And between the co-chairs, there are those who have great expertise in particular wine styles, who perhaps if asked to, um, um, to, to opine on a particularly unusual Turkish red, will, know, will have tasted it, will know what the great variety tastes like, know what it should be like, and are able to offer some help to the to the panel who may not have that much experience with that particular style of wine. So that I think is is an important um, aspect of of the tasting. Um, we I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Trying to cut short so there's you've got a time for um, talking and questions. <sighs> to be honest, price was another criteria that we had in the first. We used to tell our our tasters what the general price range was. And we stopped because we found that that didn't work either. What happened in those cases is that if we told the tasters that it was an inexpensive wine, the reaction was likely to be, oh, it doesn't cost very much. So it's, it's probably not gonna be worth a gold. And that meant that, that inexpensive wines, conversely, 
if we said this is a really expensive wine, this is over 20 pounds a bottle, the tasting panel very often said, whoa, that's really expensive. If it's that expensive, surely it should be better than it is. And they didn't give it a medal either. So we, we abandoned that. And now our great value awards um, are determined by the organizers after all the tasting has been done. They know the retail price of the wine. They know the market has been awarded by the panel and the co-chairs. And they can then correlate those two and see which the wines are that offer really, really good value. And that's how the great value wines are awarded. Purely arithmetical, uh, arithmetically looking at the conclusion of the, of the tasting panel and the co-chairs and the price of the wine. So I think that's probably takes takes us through most of the points I wanted to make. I hope I haven't dropped out um, too much from the point of view of, of Wi-Fi reception here in the beautiful little medieval town of Toro. Um, it's not particularly good, but anyway, that's that's me. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, Charles. Um, lovely presentation, um, different angles from both of you, but they, they seem to be matching up. Um, Keith, you had, uh, so please please feel free to ask questions. I think Keith had something that he had put up. Um, Keith, do you mind unmuting yourself or do you want me to do it? Okay, I should be unmuted. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. <laughs> okay. I believe that wine lovers drink wine because it's art and not science. And we're trying to grade wine in a scientific way, perhaps not a particularly good scientific way. And a music critic would never dream of rating an opera such as Tosca as 99 and La Traviata as 98 and the Kaufman performance as 100 and the Domingo performance as 99, because it, it, it is far too complex to put it down to numbers. So to me, the whole business of scoring seems to be irrelevant, other than I would consider in a very basic way, just as you might rate a restaurant five stars and another one four stars, something like that perhaps could work quite well. It concerns me as well, this isn't so much on competitions, but on general tastes, that there's been this huge grade inflation as there has with school examinations etc and now there are so many wines of little pedigree that are scoring 96 97 you know and they how can they compare with the very top wines of the world um what i'm saying is that um, it seems to me that tasters feel obliged now to mark up up and up. And my final point is that there are many different methods of assessment that aren't being used. One that I use when we're judging the crew, uh, for the crew bourgeois is by elimination all the time. Someone's given a number of wines, one eliminates three, one eliminates another two, and then one finishes up with top wine. That's not giving them grades. So that seems to make sense. And the other method is that the industry tends not to use a uh, triangle test, which is used by the Society of Sensory Professionals. That's got good use. Free alternative force choice tests, et cetera, which the I ISO use, that's got good use as well. So to be honest, I think that we are amateurs playing a professional game and that as I say, is it, it, it really shouldn't be judged down to very fine points anyway. <laughs> Can I reply to that? Please. <laughs> um, okay, Keith, what I, I, I mean, there are various points, very good points that you've raised. Um, the point about grade inflation or point inflation, I think it's interesting because I was talking to someone um, only yesterday, seeking sort of opinions and advice and whatever. And I was told um, that the IWC, and as I say, I'm no longer involved with the IWC, but the IWC only gives medals to 40% of the wines that are entered. I would also say that, that actually over the course of my wine life, wines have improved hugely. And I'm sure that's something that you would agree with. There are not the number of rank, disgusting, undrinkable wines that there were when I first started drinking wine. Um, I don't want to get into the topic of natural wines because I think we, we would sort of stray from the main topic of this discussion. But I think wines are better in general. And A, a that, and B, I think there are some competitions, and I would suggest that the IWC is one, that are still pretty severe. And I think 
the last time I was aware of the results, I think only two and a half percent of the wines entered got gold medals. Um, maybe it's more now, maybe it's four percent, but it's still, it's a small percentage. And although, yes, you're right, I think mark inflation has definitely happened. I think you have to be, be strict in your awarding of top marks and make them really worth something. And I think the IWC tries hard to do that. I take your point, Charles, but what I think one of the problems, of course, is that um, people use competitions, I'm talking organisers, to be honest, as a way of raising money. And um, I, I think Decanter would be dead were it not for the World Wine Awards, um, for example. So they feel obliged to give more medals than perhaps they should. Uh, the Vin Italy competition, which I've judged at in the past, gives 5% of the wine any sort of medal. You know, so the, the, the perhaps um, <laughs> medal inflation is it, it, still with us. <laughs> Very interesting. Dominic, you had a point to make on that, um, following which I think Meg um, has also got something interesting on the mathematical side. Dominic, I think you're on mute. Uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to point out that the OIV have a set of criteria um, for wine competitions. And if you want to say your competition is done according to OIV principles, um, you, you can't give more than 30% of the wines any medal. Um, I've posted a link to the the full set of rules there in the, in the chat. Um, I, I made the other point in the chat that, you know, Keith's comparison to music and opera, I think, you know, you do get opera critics who give star ratings or marks out of 10 for overall performances. So I think there is some comparison there by professional critics, as there may be justified for professional wine critics. Um, but I have taken part in IWC with, with, with Charles, um, the past few years. And I, I take what you say, Charles, about a lot of the things you do there that are very good and do aim to, to get great outcomes and fair outcomes. Um, but it did feel to me that in the earlier rounds, the wines were being pushed up and that it was only wines that a panel threw out that would be retasted by a judge. If a panel had ruled in a wine to go through the second round, uh, the, the co-chairs wouldn't retaste it and then throw it out instead. Um, and, you know, to Keith's point, I think the, the profitability of these competitions is a moral hazard because you rely on you know, the entrants wanting to come back to you. Um, and I see this for the English Wine Awards that I'm involved with. Wine GB give out medals and there's the Independent English Wine Awards giving out medals and producers who have tended to do better in one or other competition will go back to that competition. There's a loyalty, there's a customer demand there for medals, which is um, a moral hazard, I think, to the organisers. That, that's all. Thanks. Back to you. And actually, that was one of the points that Neil made. One of one of the criteria he didn't get to is pay pay for play. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm sure that that producers will go back to competitions who reward them generously. Um, and the, our hope, or I say the IWC's hope, I guess, is that by rewarding what we consider to be good wines appropriately generously we will continue to have those producers entering their wines because apart from everything else we enjoy tasting them um, and the other thing about the iwc is that there is quite a rigid system of of trying to judge the judges um and taking the opinions of the co-chairs as <laughs> being, you know our our version of gospel um, it then we it, 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 every year all the judges are ranked by how much they differ in their opinions from that of the co-chairs. It's a heck of a mathematical undertaking, and that is what determines whether an associate judge moves up to judge, or whether a judge moves up to um, senior judge, and eventually possibly to be a panel chair and a co-chair. Uh, Neil, do you have anything to add here, or can we? Yeah, I've been typing uh, responses and comments in the chat, but I can I can go on. Um, let me address Meg's point first. Um, I'm under no illusion that 
my objections, which are not just my objections to wine competitions, are going to cause them to go away. Uh, they're they're too much ingrained in in the wine culture um, for that to happen. And uh, Meg says, why bother with all the math if you can't rely on what the judges are are saying? Well, in a sense, um, there there is out there a mathematically rigorous method to come up with a ranking for the wines uh, that is easy to use. If you spend a little time looking at the charts, it's all arithmetic. There's nothing, there's nothing arcane about it. The theory behind why Borda is better is a little more arcane and you don't have to go look at it. Um, there's also a way of, of uh, binning the wines that's sort of related to Borda that I wrote about, but I didn't touch on here. And that binning method is very, very close to what the California competition uses, where the judges assign uh, categories, you know, bronze, bronze plus, or whatever, they've converted to numbers. And that comes up with at, at least a uh, defensible way of assigning the medals and arriving at a consensus. Um, the thing that I found Charles's uh, presentation, of course, well informed by experience and so on. But one thing that really interests me is whether or not these judges were tested in the same way that Hodgson did, where the same wine was poured in the flight from the same bottle, and the assessment made by each judge was was uh, examined to see if, in fact, they regarded it as the same wine. That, that's, I, I mean, to me, that's absolutely fundamental that a judge should be able to detect within some error bars, whether or not they're tasting exactly the same wine in a flight, because if not, then that judge's assessments are immediately thrown into doubt. To, to answer your question, Neil, um, we do, sorry, the IWC, does put in some wines multiple times to see whether it gets the same mark. But um, to answer your question, no, we're not testing individual judges like that. And I can quite see why it would be useful to test individual judges to see if they can recognize the same wine, let alone give it the same mark. Um, but no, we're generally seeing, we're, I suppose we're testing our method by putting the same wine in more than once, we are trying to check that the same wine does get the same mark. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, I really have no idea what the results of those duplicate tastings have been. Meg, do you want to, are you happy with the answer? Or do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I thank you both, Neil and Charles. This has been really fascinating and thought provoking. Um, I think that it, truly the design of the experiment is what what I'm hearing is is critical. The 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 testing of the uh, panelists or judges, the rigorous evaluation of their skills. Um, I've been a sensory panelist for a private corporation that rigorously tested our palates with many repeat wines, et cetera, and only those who with consistent results would be invited back, for example. But then the design of the experiment. I mean, basically, a competition is a test, and test design is very challenging. And that's what I'm hearing both of you saying. I think that's all. I'll finish with. Thank you, uh, Viv Vivian. You had um, a question or a statement about OIV's um, uh, restricted um, stats. Do you want to bring that out? Yeah, it was only I think Charles had said forty percent, and I've, I've just come back from judging for OIV, and it's currently thirty percent. That was all; it was a statement. But it, yeah, they're very different competitions, and I, I, uh, different I, I, stars, I, different numbers. You can't really compare them. No, and our forty percent is is purely on on the wines that we find to be good. We don't set a limit, so we don't mark some wines down having given them medals because we've exceeded a 30 a, a notional figure a notional percentage and the idea of the uh, italian competition only giving five percent of wines entered any kind of medal i find really quite difficult to get my head around because 
sure they have more good wines than that. But I guess, you know, if you're talking about Olympics, you've only got a gold, a silver, and a bronze medal with them. But that's not the way that the IWC is run. Right. Uh, we'll take one last question, if that's okay, because we're running out of time. Beverly, um, on the mathematical side, I think you had something to ask. Uh, could you kindly unmute yourself? Um, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, maybe I should put my video on to be a bit more friendly. Hi. Um, yeah, no, I was, in, I mean, this raises a whole load of questions, um, fascinating stuff. Um, I was interested to know what Neil thought about um, how IWC and other competitions are run. Um, and I, I mean, one thing nobody has mentioned, of course, is money, uh, which is a which is a big motivator for, for, for many of these competitions. Um, I was wondering if, well, there are a few things, <laughs> like I, I've, I've put it in my in the note here, which you can probably all see. So is, is there any mathematical validity in the way that competitions are run? Um, the, the fact that you end up with a small number of highly qualified people effectively judging all the medals or even every wine again, I'm not sure. Um, is this actually a better way of doing things? Does it really effectively mean that we'd be better off with uh, just a small number of people who are very, very well qualified and excellent tasters judging everything. Uh, and it, it, yeah, so it's, would it be better to just abandon competitions altogether, uh, finances notwithstanding, uh, and just go with small group tastings? Would that not be a fairer way of judging wine? So yeah, I was, uh, your question uh, goes right to the, to the core here. I am no fan of wine competitions. Um, and this, this is not attacking anybody, but uh, I've sat in watching one. Um, uh, there are a list of issues that I put at the front of the chart. Uh, we only had time to address two. Um, I, I don't believe there's such thing as super judges or super tasters. Um, I think the little bit of science that's been done in, in assessing the reliability of judge, judges shows that very, very few, even under fairly relaxed conditions are uh, in, in fact reliable. Um, so, so the question is, what are the purposes of these competitions? And that's, that's a whole separate session here. If, if it's to somehow highlight uh, at some point of, in time, how one wine ranks against another, uh, I question the validity of that. I, I have wines changing in my glass over, over the course of a dinner and uh, eliciting different responses from me and from my dinner guests. Um, so I'm not sure that wine competitions at all give us anything useful. And the business about you know pay for play is is my attempt at pointing out that these things are businesses fundamentally and that um, there there are wineries that I know of that don't even bother entering competitions because they understand all the issues with them. So uh, bottom line is in a perfect world there would be no wine competitions. Everybody would taste as much as possible, uh, gauge their palate against. Um, their wine merchant or, or, or somebody who wrote about wine that seemed to match them and source their wines accordingly. Interesting. Thank you so much uh, for your views. Um, Winnie, uh, shall I leave to you? Uh, because we are done with time. Well, thanks both Charles and Neil. That was very insightful and um, a lot of food for thought. So, uh, Thank you very much for the research and putting that big presentation together, Neil. I really um, am going to be looking at it a little bit more closely after this. Leaves me to wish you all a very happy weekend.